Welcome back to Saturday Night Books, everyone. This is Roma and Tony from St. Catharines, Ontario, live on May 1st, 2017. Before we get started, we just wanted to give a huge thank you to Audible for supporting Saturday Night Books. If you want a 30 day free trial, go to audible.com forward slash Saturday Night Books for amazing audiobooks. So recently, I read an article about an alleged CIA surveillance program that targets everyday gadgets ranging from smart TVs to smartphones to cars. This can be scary, especially because technology is everywhere today. As a result, people are becoming increasingly worried that they've lost the control of their privacy, thus, creating an atmosphere of anxiety and mistrust towards the government. So, what book are we discussing today, Roma? Well, the book we're going to talk about today is a novel that depicts the dangers of a totalitarian society. We are, of course, talking about 1984 by George Orwell. With dizzying advances in technology and the ubiquity of social media and mass surveillance now a part of our social, economic, and political lives, there isn't a book that is more relevant to today's society than 1984. For those who have never read the book, 1984 is a dystopian novel written in 1949 that takes place in the nation of Oceania, which is under the control of the ruling party. In this society, everyone's actions are closely surveilled by the party through a device called the telescreen, and the face of the party's ominescent leader, known as Big Brother, is on every corner of every street. The party controls absolutely everything in Oceania. History is shaped to the needs of the party so that it may maintain complete social control and continue its immortal legacy through the manipulation of records, memories, and reality itself. In addition, the party forces the implementation of an invented language called Newspeak, with the ultimate goal that no one will be capable of conceptualizing anything that might question the party's absolute power. Even thinking rebellious thoughts is illegal. This is known as thought crime, and is in fact the worst crime of all. The book follows the journey of Winston Smith, a low ranking member of the ruling party, and his desperate need to understand how and why the party exercises such absolute power in Oceania. So, totalitarian governments are known to use torture and physical pain to achieve total submission from all people who are under them. Throughout history, there have been many examples of this approach to power. A prime example would be Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Empire. The use of gas chambers, concentration camps, and other forms of torture were very common during his time. Hitler's thirst for power knew no boundaries, and he was prepared to torture any political opponents who opposed or challenged him. This example in particular highly overlaps with the circumstances that Winston is living in, due to the fact that the party uses physical torture to eliminate any opposition and to create an empire which is second to none. The following lines are spoken by Julia, Winston's ex lover, to Winston as they discuss what happened to them in Room 101, a torture chamber in the Ministry of Love, in which the party attempts to subject a prisoner to his or her own worst nightmare, fear, or phobia, with the intent of breaking down their resistance. I betrayed you, she said baldly. I betrayed you, he said. She gave him another quick look of dislike. Sometimes, she said, they threaten you with something, something you can't stand up to. Can't even think about. And then you say, don't do it to me, do it to somebody else, do it to so and so. And perhaps you might pretend afterwards that it was only a trick and that you just said it to make them stop and didn't really mean it. But that isn't true. At the time when it happens, you do mean it. You think there's no other way of saving yourself, and you're quite ready to save yourself that way. You want it to happen to the other person. You don't give a damn what they suffer. All you care about is yourself. So here, Julia tells Winston that she wanted her torture to be shifted to him, and he responds that he felt exactly the same way. Soon after they are set free by the party, following their respective experiences in Room 101, Julia says that despite her efforts to make herself feel better, she really did want the party to torture Winston instead in order to save herself. These acts of mutual betrayal symbolize the party's psychological victory and proves to Winston and Julia that no moral conviction or emotional loyalty is strong enough to withstand physical torture. Physical pain and fear will always cause people. People to betray their beliefs and opinions if they know that doing so will end their pain and suffering. Orwell successfully portrays a theme that control over the body ultimately grants a control over the mind. However, this is an extremely ironic scene. People's self love and self preservation, which are the underlying components of individualism, causes them to fear pain and suffering. Yet, these are the things that ultimately cause one to accept anti individualist. Listic ideas that allows the party to continue its absolute control over its people. However, we know that this is not always true. Throughout history, many people have stood by their beliefs, even at the cost of their own lives. For instance, Thomas More, leading servant by King Henry VIII, was beheaded for his refusal to accept Henry VIII's rejection of the Catholic Church. In addition, Mahatma Gandhi, the leader of the Indian independence movement, once said, 
You can chain me, you can torture me, you can even destroy this body, but you will never imprison my mind. This is definitely something to think about. So that is it for today. Thank you for being part of our second ever episode of Saturday Night Books. We want to conclude today's discussion with a question for everyone to think about over the next few days. Is reality objective existing independently of our perception, or is reality subjective existing only in our perception? Which carries over to the question, can two people see the same reality differently? If so, which is a real reality? Tune in next week for an exclusive one-hour session where we closely analyze the book Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi. Bye!